Like John Lewis said, get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and redeem the soul of America. I feel honored to introduce you to my colleague and Rose, someone who is unafraid to speak truth to power. He understands that leading productive conversations about racism in schools is part of our responsibility as educational leaders. I know that you join our speaker in embracing our place in history at this unique time in history. We have the opportunity to engage in conversations that can lead to an inclusive and just society. Equity and social justice must begin in our schools and districts if we are to redeem the soul of America. My colleague, Sean Harper, is a provost professor in the Rossier School of Education and the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. He is also the Clifford and Betty Ellen Chair in Urban Leadership, founder and executive director of the USC Race and Equity Center, president of the American Educational Research Association, and a past president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. Dr. Harper's research focuses primarily on race, gender, and other dimensions of equity in an array of organizational contexts including K-12 schools, colleges and universities, and corporations. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and John Hopkins University Press publishing his 13th book, Race Matters in College. And his research has been cited in more than 14,000 published studies and funded by more than $15 million Hello? in grants. The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and several thousand other news outlets have quoted Professor Harper and featured his research. He has interviewed on CNN, ESPN, and NPR. He has testified to the U.S. House of Representatives and presented his research to various White House and his Department of Education convenings. He was appointed to President Barack Obama's My Brother's Keeper Advisory Council in 2015 and recognized in Education Week as one of the most influential professors in the field of education. As part of Dr. Harper's commitment to help urban districts confront systemic and structural racial issues, he has partnered with numerous K-12 school systems, including the Los Angeles Unified School District, to train administrators and teachers to courageously address unacceptable conditions for the youth in our public schools. Please, with that, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Sean Harper. Thank you so much, Dr. for that very generous introduction, but also thank you for being such an amazing colleague and friend to me here at USC Rasir. And furthermore, thank you for all of your contributions over the entirety of your career to schools and education. You are one of those educational leaders that I've long looked up to and I just there's so much that I appreciate and admire about you. It's such a pleasure to join you and so many of our other colleagues in this virtual space at this time. Thank you all for having me. Uh, thank you for this wonderful partnership between a AASA, the USC Rasir School of Education, and Howard University. As a proud alumnus, historically black university, I was thrilled when I got to USC and I heard that we have this relationship with Howard. Howard is really special to me. Um, I've been there numerous times, at least a couple dozen times for various talks. I think the highlight for me was last fall, the distinct privilege and honor of delivering the Charles Thompson Distinguished Lecture there at Howard, which is a thing that I'll never forget. It was such a wonderful experience. Howard was one of the 42 colleges and universities in my National Black Male College Achievement Study. I could just go on and on and on about how much I love and admire and respect Howard University. So it was such a pleasure for me to be invited to spend this time with you today as a part of this wonderful collaboration. Um, so we're talking about leadership, educational leadership. 
more specifically. Let me just start here by saying that I spend most of my time with leaders and executives. Here at the USC Race and Equity Center, we do our work in three portfolios, K-12 schools and districts, colleges and universities, and corporations and businesses. Across each of those three portfolios, I spend the most of my time with principals and superintendents, college presidents, deans and provosts, and CEOs and C-suite corporate executives. I understand and appreciate that leaders have a lot to do and a lot to think about. I also understand that educational leadership in this moment is particularly tough as we go back to abnormal versions of schooling. Um, that is not lost on me that leaders are having to think about PPE and physical distancing and whether or not to return or not return to in-person instruction, how to effectively uh, support students and ensure instructional quality for those who are learning in remote environments or in a hybrid format. I understand that that's a lot. I understand that leaders have budgets to think about and um, an instructional program to lead. I get all of that. But let me add just one more thing to the leadership plate that I think is really, really important. It's always been important, but it is especially important right now. And that is leading productive conversations about race and racism in schools. That has to also be a part of the leader's portfolio of responsibility. Let me start by making sure that all understand current movement. Notice that I didn't call it a moment, but instead a movement. So let's talk about what this movement is actually about. It was in fact the terrible, gruesome murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery that sparked this movement, that compelled millions of people all across the United States and indeed around the globe to take to the streets those first three weeks in June. There's still people marching in the streets, even right now, because of these murders. But the movement isn't just about the murders of these three Black Americans. Educational leaders have to also understand that this movement is in response to police killings of unarmed Black people without consequence for centuries. When we trace back the history of law enforcement, it started with slave catching, higher gun um, owning, gun toting white people, white men who were sent out to hunt and prey, Black people who were attempting to escape the brutal institution of slavery. What we're seeing right now is a movement in which the nation is saying we've had enough with the killings of unarmed Black people at the hands of the police. Not just in 2020, not just over these past five years, but really over centuries and decades. To be sure, people aren't just protesting police misconduct and police brutality. They're also protesting other manifestations of structural and systemic racism, anti-Blackness, and white supremacy in all their forms, not just in the criminal justice system, but also in our healthcare system, also in housing and wealth inequities, and most certainly in educational inequities, right? I think what we are hearing the world say is that we have reached a point where people are fed up with seeing Black people and Black students placed at the bottom of just every statistical metric of well-being, progress, performance, and outcomes. That's what people are protesting, not just policing. One last thing. People are taken to the streets in protest of and on long-standing racial problems and racial inequities, including those inequities that we see year after year after year in our schools. When we look at student achievement data, those inequities, 
and the lack of leadership on closing racial gaps and gaps between and among students from different racial and ethnic groups. That's also a part of what people are protesting during this movement. Just wanted to make sure that we all understood that it's not just about the murder of George Floyd, not to minimize his murder. It was terrible. It was really just absolutely terrible. But the movement is also about these other things. You may have noticed that shortly after George Floyd's murder, many educational leaders in K-12 environments, as well as in higher education, were writing these statements to members of their campus communities to express a range of things from grief to outrage to sympathy, so on and so forth. My colleague, Dorinda Carter Andrews, who herself is an amazing educational leader. She's on the faculty at Michigan State University there in the College of Education. Uh, she chairs the teacher education department there. Professor Carter Andrews and I wrote this piece in Education Week in which gave guidance to school leaders across the country who were writing statements about the murder of George Floyd because so few of them actually knew what to say, how to say it, how to effectively communicate with their teachers, with their students, with parents and family members and community members. So Professor Carter Andrews and I gave guidance. It very quickly became the most read piece in Ed Week of 2020. I think that is a signal to us right, that leaders need more guidance on these issues, right? Leaders need more educational and professional preparation, not just in moments of crisis, like this one, but also in the everyday manifestations of racism and racial inequities, leaders need help. To be sure, um, my saying that isn't just about the response that we got to the Ed Week article, but also here at the USC Race and Equity Center, we work with schools and districts all across the country of various in various regions and so on. And the truth is, we hear time and time and time again from teachers that they didn't learn enough about race and racism in their teacher preparation programs. We hear from principals that their principal certification program curriculum were largely raceless. We hear from superintendents that their EDD programs did not include enough opportunity for them to amass a set of problem solving skills to lead districts on tough, complex racial problems. Look, I understand that we all come to this work of educational leadership with the right values. We wanna do the right thing by children and their families. We wanna lead schools and districts by skill and with effectiveness. The thing is, we're going nowhere fast in our pursuit of racial equity, in our pursuit of diversity and inclusion and fairness. We can't talk about race. We can't solve racial problems in our schools and districts if we can't talk about race. And it's on the educational leader to lead those conversations, to lead those uh, professional learning experiences for students and for teachers and staff. Let me spend a moment now talking about how we typically engage conversations about race in schools. We don't. We typically avoid conversations about race. In fact, my research has made painstakingly clear as I've traveled the country doing interviews and observations of teachers and school leaders, that people, educators, have learned how to talk around race, but not talk about race. If you haven't read it, you might check out Michael Pollock's book, Color Mute. Professor Pollock spent more than a year in a school district, and she was observing how teachers and school leaders were making sense of racial inequities that they were seeing in student achievement data and in other forms and other sources. And what 
Professor Pollock found and what has been repeatedly confirmed in my research is that educators don't talk about this stuff, they talk around it. There are these code words that we use to talk about particular racial groups without naming them. We most certainly do not talk about racial problems and the realities of race in our schools. In the rare instances where we do talk about these things, you know, let's say a colleague says something that was racially offensive. Typically what we do in educational settings is that we'll go to a different colleague and say, did you hear what that teacher said or what that, what the vice principal said, the assistant principal said? It sounded a little offensive, it's perhaps even racist. We may even go to a small group of colleagues to process and at times even gossip about these issues. But very rarely do we go to the person who actually said or did the racist thing or the racially offensive thing. The problem with that is that it denies that kind of opportunity to realize that they said something that was offensive, almost always inadvertently or even unknowingly. They didn't mean to do it, but if we don't bring to their attention that they did it, then they're gonna do it again, over and over and over and over again. Because no one has brought to their attention that what they did or said was problematic. We tend to only talk about race in schools in the aftermath of a significant racial crisis at the school. Meaning there's something that has happened at the school that has garnered the attention of the local media, sometimes even the national media, right? And at that point, we have no choice but to call a town hall meeting in the gymnasium or the cafeteria, bring everybody together and make a decision. But even almost always, the goal is to make this go away as quickly as possible so that we can resume to normal without understanding that normal itself is often racist, right? That we would be sustaining um, and normalizing the everydayness of racial tensions, racism, racial inequities in our schools when our aim is to immediately return to normal. What I'm also saying here is that rarely do we as educators and educational leaders seize the opportunity to take good educational advantage of a racial crisis that has happened nationally or even locally in our, in our cities and towns, right? What a shame that we deny our students an opportunity to learn about what's right and what's wrong, what's racially appropriate and what's racially offensive. Why something was in fact so racially divisive. What a shame that we don't integrate with high degrees of skill and intentionality these real-time current events and case studies into the curriculum and across the curriculum to afford our students a proper course of study about race in America. What a shame that again, even when there's a national tragedy around something racial, we tend to not talk about it at school. There's one more thing that often happens. Conversations about race and racism in school are too often handed to the Black teachers and Black school leaders to handle and to lead, right? Oftentimes, Black educators will say to me, I don't know why they came to me. I, I, I'm no more skilled on these issues than they are. I, I, too, went to the same kinds of K-12 schools. I went through the same teacher education program or I went through the same principal certification program that didn't include anything about race, just like the rest of them. Why would you come to me and expect me to be the expert? Oh, it's because I'm black. That's what typically happens. We typically saddle the burden of solving racial problems and leading on race with the black administrators, the black teachers. We need everybody to amass the skills to lead on these. In the interest of time, I want to spend just a couple more minutes here talking about this first point. 
avoidance because it is the thing that we do almost every why do we avoid talking about race and racism in our schools and districts in our views and in our research with teachers and school leaders it becomes really clear to us that avoidance is cultural in most schools what i mean by that is that there is a culture of avoidance i've not yet seen a school or a district that has an explicit policy as you can't talk about race here. Instead, that message is implicitly conveyed to what we call organizational newcomers. What I mean by that is new teachers and new school leaders who come to a school in their first year or come to a district in their first year. There are all sorts of racial tensions, racial problems, racial inequities, and so on but yet nobody's talking about them. They're hiding in plain sight. Everybody can see them, but nobody talks about them and people talk around them. That very clearly signals to a new teacher or a new school leader that that's what we do here. We avoid these things. So very quickly, new colleagues of ours adhere to the cultural norms that have been set in a school around the talking about and handling of racial issues. Again, many educators say to us, sometimes with some degree of embarrassment, actually, that honestly, I don't talk about race here because I never really learned how to in my K-12 education or in my teacher ed or principal certification or my EDD program if I'm a superintendent. Furthermore, in addition to personal and educational inexperience. People also have professional inexperience around these issues, right? What I mean by that is that one who has ascended to the principalship did not really have lots of rehearsal opportunities when she was a teacher, when she was a teacher leader, when she became an assistant principal. There was very little professional education offered through the professional associations in which she holds membership through the district's professional learning programs and certainly through the school's professional learning programs in the various schools where she's worked. So no wonder she's now the principal and she doesn't know what to do when there's a racial crisis or there's racial tensions or there are racial inequities. The one time PD that she sat through on culturally responsive teaching was enough to prepare her to lead on these issues as a principal. Just a couple more. I'm gonna get these out by race. In our research and in our professional uh, development partnerships with schools and districts, white teachers and white school leaders say to us that they don't talk about race because they don't wanna make a mistake and mis you know, like unintentionally offend a colleague or offend a student or offend a parent or family member, so they just stay away from it because they, they're walking on eggshells. They don't want to offend anyone. They also say to us, especially the leaders, I don't go there because I don't want to be seen as naive on race, even though I'm naive on race. Like, I don't know, but I'm the, I'm the superintendent. I, I can't be out there like all exposed that I don't know what I'm doing on this. I'm supposed to be the leader. So therefore, I'm either going to fake it or I'm going to avoid it. More often than not, I'm going to avoid it. Except in the, in the time I'm like super pressed by my students or by our community, then I'll just fake it. But otherwise, I'm just going to stay away from it because I like actually don't know what I'm doing on this. So one last thing. I've been Black my whole life. Um, you know, I can only speak on behalf of myself. I've never been a white person, but I imagine I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I imagine that the worst thing to call a white person is racist. Many educational leaders tell me and tell us in our partnerships with them that I don't want to be misperceived as racist if I put myself out there on these topics and I make a mistake. Right. I, 
I, I don't want people to think of me as racist. All right, teachers and school leaders of color often say to us that they don't feel safe raising these issues in their schools and in their districts, in part because of their underrepresentation, because there are so few teachers of color and teachers from various um, racial and ethnic groups that are not white in most school settings. You know, they don't feel safe being the one to call attention to the racial problems and the racial tensions and when someone does or says something racist, right? Why do they not feel safe? Oh, it's because they saw another teacher or another school leader attempt to take this on and address it in a prior period. And that person was shut down or marginalized, pushed to the margins, pushed out of the school, pushed out of the district or whatever. You know, frankly, as a matter of economic self-protection, many school leaders tell me, look, I have a family to feed. I have to keep this good paying job. So I'm not going to put myself out there and risk, you know, upsetting parents and upsetting members of the community by talking about these racial issues. I'm not going to do it. Many leaders of color also tell us that they don't want to be misperceived as the angry Latina or the angry black man who's constantly raising these races, making the white people comfortable. So therefore they avoid it. Lastly, I told you two slides ago that in the rare chances, in the rare instances where we do talk about race in schools, almost always the burden is placed on black people to lead those conversations. You know, black people. Black educators and leaders and leaders of color across other groups tell us that, they are, that they're tired of always having to be the ones to raise these issues and to lead on them. Like, why does it always have to be me? Like, no, I'm going to sit this one out. This, they tell us, right, that that's, that's why I avoid talking about race. Yeah, because I did it last time. So it has to be on somebody else this time. You know, there's language for this. Um, racial battle fatigue is the, is the term. It is the literal exhaustion that ensues on Black professionals across industries when they have to time and time and time and time again fight to get the school, in this instance, in this context, fight to get the school to be uh, more culturally responsive, fight to get the school to stop stereotyping, um, families of color and communities of color, having to fight to get more teachers of color hired, having to fight to get the district to invest in the leadership ascension and professional um, acceleration of the career of other people of color. After a while, all fighting people get, educators and leaders get tired and therefore just sort of opt out. One last thing to explain avoidance. Most educators and educational leaders are simply afraid they tell us that conversations about race are going to be explosive and divisive for those two reasons they avoid talking about those things in their schools they expect that they're going to be explosive and divisive let me now in our remaining time together, share with you some ways to engage these topics productively so that they are not explosive and passive. You know, I have been a professional educator now for 22 years. The USC Race and Equity Center is just about a decade old. I founded it during my tenure at the University of Pennsylvania and brought it with me to USC Rossier when I joined the faculty here three years ago. Over my now 22 year career and over the decade long lifespan of the center, our claim to fame and perhaps my claim to fame is that I've never had one of these conversations about race go off the rails or be explosive or divisive, nor have any of my colleagues at the center. So these activities and strategies and approaches that I'm about to share with you are ones that we have seen work brilliantly time and time again at K-12 schools and districts, colleges and universities, and companies and businesses and corporations and firms um, for many years. All right, so let's get into them. 
The first is as a part of a professional development, professional learning experience. Invite every employee, every educator, every school leader, every staff member to write on stage personal racial history. Give those colleagues some prompts ahead of time and say to them, all right, next Thursday, we're gonna have this 90 minute or one hour, or however long it is, PD on race in advance of that PD. I want you each to write a one, definitely no more than two page reflection on your own personal racial history and bring it with you to the PD that we're doing next week. Some of those questions, I have a list of about 20. Uh, these are just some of, uh, of the questions. And I always say when I'm facilitating these kinds of professional learning experiences for schools, I say to teachers and leaders, don't treat this like a checklist, going down and answering every question. In fact, you don't have to answer any of these questions. These questions are merely intended to stimulate your reflection on your personal racial history. You know, some of the questions among my list of 20, how was race treated and talked about in your family? What did your parents teach you about people who were from racial groups that are different from your own? How diverse was the neighborhood in which you grew up? What was the racial composition of the schools that you attended in your K-12 educational experience? If yours was a religious family, what was the demographic makeup of the SUG or the mosque or the church or the other place where your family came together to worship alongside others? What did you learn about race and racism in schools in your K-12 curriculum? Can you map in your K-12 curriculum, as a matter of fact, where you learn substantive particular thing about racism in America? Not that one time that there was the one page in the history textbook about George Washington Carver. Then there was the one paragraph in the textbook about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. I'm not talking about those three pages in history textbooks. I'm talking about where in the K-12 educational curriculum did you learn about systemic and structural racism, right? And about the ways in which Latinx communities and Asian American and Pacific Islander communities and Black communities and indigenous communities are persistently and chronically disadvantaged in America. Where'd you learn that? Reflect on it. What did you learn about Black men from watching the news when you were growing up? How were Black men portrayed in the local news in the place where you grew up? Where and how did you unlearn racism and implicit bias. You all were with dear friend and fraternity brother, Bryant Marks, who is one of the nation's leading experts on implicit bias. I've seen Dr. Marks's presentations on implicit bias and they, they are excellent. I am sure that Dr. Marks convinced you that we all have implicit, implicit bias. bias. And he is absolutely right about that. We all have it, right? Well, given that, where did we unlearn that bias that we were taught when we were children, that we bring to school and that we bring to district offices with us every day? Where, where, where did we unlearn that? So these are just some of the questions, right? Um, people write their, their two page, you know, it's, it's interesting. Every time we give people a range, one to two pages, every two pages. Sometimes people discard the instructions and they come with like 10 pages. Like we told you to just come with two. Okay, so they come to, to the session. Everybody's done the exercise of writing. We put people into pairs and we give them about 15 to 20 minutes to engage in pair shares. So talk with another colleague for 20 minutes about what you all discovered about yourselves as you wrote your personal racial histories. Every single time when we get to the 20 minute mark, people are like, okay, could, could we have just five more minutes or 10 more minutes? Like we're totally into it, right? I always foolishly give people more time and then we end up running out of time, running short on time. All right, so what ends up happening is that the people talking in their pair shares and we bring them back together and the facilitator, the person leading it, 
I think that person should be you, right? That's the whole purpose, by the way, of these strategies that I'm sharing with you. I want you to actually employ these strategies as you uh, take on um, and engage in, in, in leadership work. So the facilitator comes back and asks people, you know, does anybody want to share some insights from your parish? Always. You don't have to beg for volunteers. People are ready. They share quite generously and sometimes quite embarrassingly. Like people will say, I'm embarrassed to tell all of my kids here in my school that my daddy was a racist. And here's what he said about Mexican people. And, you know, I just presumed that I'm not like my daddy and that I don't have these views about Mexican Americans. But actually, this exercise helped me realize that that might be an assumption. I can't really tell you where those messages that my daddy um, taught me and my siblings, where I unlearned those things and confronted them and so on, right? It, it ends up being a really productive conversation. It ends up being a way for educators to comfortably enter into sometimes a first time ever conversation. That's another thing, by the way, that happens with this exercise. So many professionals, including principals in their 50s, Say, you know, I'm 52. This is the first time in 52 years. I'm not 52, I'm 45. I'm 52. This is the first time in 52 years that I've ever asked myself these questions or that I was ever expected to ask myself these questions and reflect on them. So because it makes it personal, it totally, totally jumpstarts the appetite, if you will, of educators and other colleagues in the school to engage further in, in these issues, right? Like they, they want to continue learning about themselves and learning about uh, other racial topics. It's an activity that works really well. Here's another one. We are currently in my living room, in my, in my home. Over these past two and a half months, since the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, more than 27,000 professionals across a range of industries, including K-12 schools and districts, have been here in my living room for professional development, professional learning uh, experiences, but also for facilitated conversations on, on race. We've been doing these most especially in our corporate portfolio, where we'll bring together all of the employees of a company here on Zoom. And I would start with them the way that I started with you. Just make sure that we all understand that the movement is about these four things, not just about the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We start there. Then we move into uh, talking about policing and people's racialized encounters with policing. I start by telling a story of an encounter that I had with police officers in 2007 that was just absolutely, absolutely unacceptable and just flat out racist. It was terrible, right? I'll spare you the details in the interest of time. So I told, I told that story to get us started and then I invite others to share. I'm telling you within a split second of me finishing and inviting the others, there are at least 10 hands raised here in Zoom, people ready to share. So what ends up happening, so this whole, this whole exercise that I'm suggesting to you is that you facilitate opportunities for reflections on firsthand encounters with racism outside of school. So, you know, I open this up and people start telling these stories about what things have happened to them um, in their interactions with the police. Then eventually after about 30 minutes, I move it into a larger conversation about, all right, let's move beyond policing and let's talk about your firsthand encounters with uh, interpersonal racism your first-hand encounters. Could I have one volunteer to help your colleagues understand what structural and systemic racism are and how it plays out in the lives of people of color? People jump in with examples. What ends up happening almost always, and it happens both in the in-person version of this and on Zoom, I could see across the Zoom squares, literally people are weeping. They're, they're in tears as they're hearing their colleagues share these horrifying stories that they've had. It makes it uh, more of a empathetic introduction or engagement with these issues. You see, because it's not that it's a man in Minneapolis I never met or a woman in Louisville, Kentucky, 
a black woman who was murdered by the police. I, I, I feel for her and her family and I feel for George Floyd and his family, but I don't know them. So I'm kind of like from a distance, right? Like, you know, maybe not as emotional for, 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 for some folks. But to hear that some version of this has happened to the teacher whose classroom is right next to mine or to our assistant principal, who is such a lovely person, an amazing person, to hear that these things are happening to people that I know in our community, that makes it more real for educators and educational leaders. It makes it more local, more personal for them. And it's, and again, like the personal racial history exercise, it compels them to want to like keep going, like let's, let's, let's keep talking about these things. Now that we know that these are real issues, right? Uh, um, that happen here too, not just in some faraway place, but they happen here too. It makes people want to keep engaging. So this, this is again, um, when we're all safely back at school, you can facilitate this in person with teachers and school leaders and an in-person PD, but you can also do it here on Zoom. Inviting seemingly taboo questions about race and racism in the school is another activity that you can employ, one that we've employed with tremendous success over the years. In the pre-pandemic version of this, I would go to a school or a district, I walk in the room and I give everybody a blank note card and three instructions. Write legibly, don't write your name anywhere on the note card. And I want you to write one question that you've long had something pertaining to race here in your school, either some sort of racial inequity or racial tensions or racial problem or something racial, a question that you've long had, but you've not asked it out loud because there is a culture of silence around talking about race here or because you just didn't feel comfortable like asking this question out loud for whatever reason. I give people a couple minutes, they write the question. Hardly ever do I get any blank card, no, note cards back. Like, really, I mean, like, I could probably count on one hand the number of times that I've gotten blank note cards back. I collect the cards, I shuffle them, and I pick five or six or seven volunteers to come and pull a card, read the question that's on the card, and then we engage in a conversation about that question. There are three things about this exercise that works really well. The first is that the person reading the card doesn't have to take any ownership in what's being read. There's a slight chance, very slight, the larger the group, the slighter the chance that the question being read is the person's question. It's more likely that it's somebody else's, but in, in either case, the person doesn't have to take any ownership. That's first. Second, the second advantage is that it helps people understand that these questions were not crowdsourced from some external entity. They were not tweeted to us. These questions came from people in this room, in this school. People have been walking around this school with all these questions about race, sometimes for years and years, that they've been afraid to ask. Okay, we clearly had some racial problems here. Well, we clearly have an opportunity here to reculture the school so that people are not afraid, educators and leaders are not afraid to engage in these questions. Okay, the third advantage. Those questions that people have been walking around with that they were so scared to death to ask as they're being read out loud, it's kind of entertaining for me. I actually prefer the in-person version of this as opposed to the, uh, the Zoom version. I'll tell you about the Zoom version in a moment. But in the in-person version, I'm telling you, like when the first person gets ready to read the question aloud, like you could see like teachers and leaders like, like you know, grab their seats, like, like sort of bracing themselves for, oh God, like here we go. Um, here comes the question that's gonna like totally destroy the culture of the school. And the person reads it and they're like, oh, oh, okay, that, that one wasn't so bad. Then they, the next person goes and they're like, okay, this is gonna be the one. No. What, what ends up happening is that people 
realize after they hear these five or six or seven questions that these are things that we ought to be talking about, but they're not divisive, explosive, polarizing kinds of things. I'll give you one like real example from yesterday. Well, first, let me tell you how to do this in um, a remote format. So realizing that you're not meeting right now, most of you, and you're like not convening all your teachers and school leaders in a cafeteria or a media center and passing out note cards and stuff, and you're instead doing PD online. If you go to bit.ly slash race question, bit.ly slash race question, no www, no HTTP in front of it, just bit.ly slash race question, you'll see an example of an anonymous survey form. It's just a one question survey um, that invites people to, you know, like, um, you know, write one question that they've long had, right, about something racial in the school or in the company or wherever. Um, you have my full permission to replicate that one item survey, but plagiarize it. You could use it word for word. You have my full permission. But it's, it's a way to crowdsource from your teachers and school leaders in your school in an anonymous fashion. Assure them that we're not tracking IP addresses on this form. It's anonymous. Um, so yesterday I did one of these with a company, um, an advertising agency. And, you know, like we stopped the, the, the session. We don't have time to do that today. We only got 14 minutes. I got to hurry. But, you know, people went to the form. They were filling it out. The responses were pouring in in real time. And I when, I, when I pulled them all back together, I started to read some of the things that had been submitted. The very first question on the form was, is it Black or is it Black American or is it African American? I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, um, yeah, you, that, that, that's probably like not a divisive, explosive question. I can't believe that you've been, and I, I don't bring a judgmental tone to these things, but you mean to tell me you've been walking around, in this case, your company for years with this question and you haven't felt comfortable? I don't know. It's just, I listen, the next, uh, okay, I said I'd give you one. I'll give you just another one re real fast. The next one, why are there zero people of color in leadership in this company? That seems like a question that needs to be asked and talked about, right? So what I'm saying to you is that these, this anonymous form or the anonymous note cards um, is, is a real safe way to see what racially is on the minds of your colleagues uh, without them having to seemingly put themselves at risk, even though they're not putting themselves at risk. The questions are not that risky at all. All right, another thing. You should invite examples of encounters with racism on campus, in the school, not just in your life outside of work, right? like that forum I talked about that you could do in person or on Zoom where people are talking about encounters with policing, encounters with structural and systemic racism outside of school. Here, you're turning inward and you're inviting examples of racial problems in racism in the school. Same thing as the previous exercise. If we were doing this in person, I walk in a room, give every educator and leader a note card, and three instructions, write legibly, don't write your name or anybody else's name on the note card. And second, and thirdly rather, write about a time that you either experienced racism firsthand in this school, not in the school where you used to work, but in this one, a time that you experienced racism firsthand, or you observed somebody behaving in a racially inappropriate way or doing something racist, or third, you either heard about something racist or something really inappropriate being said or happening in your school. So take a couple minutes on your note card, write succinctly, don't put your name or anybody else's name. People will write the things. Sometimes I do get blank note cards back or I get cards back to say I don't have any examples, but always I get way too many note cards with way too many examples. Same thing, shuffle the cards, pick some volunteers from the audience, come read the card. People read the card out loud. First thing you do is you first invite collective sense making. What's wrong here? Why is this particular situation that was just read, what makes it racist? What about it is offensive, right? 
teachers and school leaders love this exercise because it invites collective sense-making, right, and analysis. Then you move to conversation two, how could this situation have been avoided? How could it have been fixed and, you know, appropriately responded to? And most importantly, how can we ensure that this thing that has happened here in this school never happens again in this school? Educators love this particular exercise. But it really permits an opportunity to fix something that's been done and to avoid it moving forward. We also leave the school leaders with all of like the whole stack of cards with the examples. Um, actually, we don't leave the cards. What we do is that we take them back here to the center and we type them. We type the responses and then send the responses back just in case like, you know, people know people's handwriting. Look, we, we type it and we send it back. And that gives then the school leader literally a, a document of like, here are lots of the racial problems that we've had. You could do it digitally, remotely. Um, if you go to bit.ly, that was racist. You'll see that there's a two item survey there that you have my full permission to reuse, whatever you wanna do. The question is right about a time that you either experienced, observed, or heard about something racist happening here. Second question, did you experience it firsthand? Did you observe, did you hear about it? Or were you the person who did the racist thing? Again, that gives you a whole just catalog of things that have happened in the school. Uh, we're running out of time. Let me go really quickly here. Um, in an in-person PD, I go to a place and we use poll everywhere. I say to every teacher and leader, pull out your smartphone, your tablet, your laptop, go to this link or type in text this number to poll, poll everywhere. And once you're in, you see the live anonymous poll on the screen behind me. So I would pose some questions about race and you know, like the responses will be coming in real time, live and we could see them, right? Using live polling is not just a way to ascertain the range of perspectives on a particular topic, but it totally then gives you an entree to leading a discussion about why people responded the way they responded. Let me give you an example. And obviously you could do it here in Zoom using the polling function in Zoom. Here's one from um, a university and I blacked out the name of, of the university. Um, we did one of these a couple of weeks ago. As you can see, there were 748 employees uh, from this particular university. And the question was, our university has serious racial problems. 748 people responded. As you can see, only 12% of them either strongly disagreed or disagreed. 15% of them said they didn't know. 75%, that's three out of four people, believe that their university these are employees, these are faculty and staff members, believe that their university has serious racial problems. I think you want to know, as an educational leader, if 75% of the teachers and school leaders in your school thought that, you, that the school had serious racial problems, wouldn't you want to know that? I think so. I think you would want to know that, right? So here's how you use these results. I close the poll on Zoom and then share the results. People see them. I start with the I don't knows. 112 of you responded that you didn't know. Could I have two or three of you say why you responded that way? Two or three people step up and say why they responded that way. Then I go to the I don't knows, right? Um, there were, or, or to, to the disagrees. There are 90 of you who either disagreed or strongly disagreed. Can I have two of you say why you disagreed? They'll come and they'll say why. Then I go to all the people who agreed. And I mean, they're ready. I mean, they, I don't even have to ask for volunteers. They're ready. And they say why they responded that way. And they usually say so with examples. Here's why I responded. Here are things that I've seen happen in our school. Here are things that I've seen other teachers and other school leaders do. That convinces me for sure that we have a serious problem here. Here are things that I've seen and heard our students say. That convinces me. 
All right, just two more in our last uh, five remaining minutes. Vignettes could be a really effective way to stimulate productive conversations about race and to invite collaborative problem solving in a, in a school. Um, let me show you what I mean by a vignette. Um, this is literally, I think, just a one and a half minute video, but I'm gonna show it to you and then I'm gonna tell you how to use it, how you can use a thing like this. New at six, the Melville School District was responding to back following a quote, culturally insensitive assignment that was handed out to fifth graders. In just the last half hour, we have confirmed that teacher responsible has been placed on administrative leave. The principal at Blades Elementary on Patterson Road in South St. Louis County says this was part of a social studies class. It was meant to address market practices that influenced early settlement in America. One of the 12 questions reads as follows. You own a plantation or farm and therefore need more workers. You begin to get involved in the slave trade industry and have slaves work on your farm. Your product to trade is slaves. Set your price for a slave. These could be worth a lot. You may trade for any items you would like. Well, the 11 other questions asked about pricing grain, apples, milk, fish, as well as other products. Principal Jeremy Booker sent out a statement saying the assignment was culturally insensitive. And okay, so that video was a minute and a half. I have seen it sustain a two hour professional development experience, like easily, like we could have kept going, but two hours. You start by the same thing that I said with the note card exercise um, about the racial uh, problems in the school. You start by, after watching the video, um, asking everybody in the room, you know, what's wrong here? What about this is racist? It may be so like obvious to me and you, but let's not take for granted that everybody in the room understands, everybody in the school understands why this is wrong. So spend some time there inviting collective analysis, then engage in a question like, um, could that happen here? I'm gonna tell you, every single place where I've shown this video and I posed that question, there have been teachers and school leaders, like actually many of them who said, yes, that absolutely could happen here. Something like that very well could happen here. Sometimes you'll have people sometimes say, no, that would never happen here in our school. Then you engage in a question like, how can we be so sure that that couldn't happen here? And here's the most important question. How can we ensure moving ahead that a thing like this never happens in our school? I think what I'm saying to you as an act of leadership, don't wait until there is a crisis or, you know, like, a thing like this that ends up on your local news that's embarrassing to take on these issues. Learn from the places where these kinds of mistakes have been made to preemptively and proactively safeguard your school from these kinds of uh, tragedies. All right, so we're almost at time here. I think you ought to formally assess the school's racial climate. Notice that I highlighted here racial climate. So many districts around the country, including here in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Unified School District has a school climate survey. School climate surveys are fine, but they don't tell us enough about race and racial tensions and people's racialized experiences. Students, faculty, and staff members racialized experiences at school. So doing a formal racial climate survey, uh, to give you data, and then you could use the data that you get from those surveys to then, again, stimulate, inform, and sustain conversations about racial problems and racial opportunities in the school. I want to be respectful of your schedule. We're at time. Let me conclude here by saying that I want you as leaders to completely disrupt the culture of avoidance in schools around conversations about race and racism. I want you to move schools and districts from avoidance, avoidance to making race salient. If for no other reason 
it has to it, it has to be about outcomes. We care about outcomes, don't we? I think so. What you see here is an article by Cynthia Lee, who is a law professor, a legal scholar. Professor Lee wrote this law review article about the murder of Trayvon Martin, and more specifically, the outcome of the George Zimmerman trial, Trayvon Martin's murderer. Cynthia Lee makes clear in this piece that the judge in this case explicitly instructed the jury in deliberations to not think about or talk about race in any form or racism or racial profiling. The judge explicitly said to the jury, you cannot talk about race when you go into that jury room to make your legal determination. Well, no wonder they came back with the outcome they came back with. That same thing happens in schools. Year after year after year, we invest so much money and so much time and so on into trying to figure out how to close the so-called achievement gap, how to close racial gaps in student outcomes. But when we go into the room or into our task forces or our teacher meetings or district meetings to try to figure out how to close those gaps between racial and ethnic groups, and we don't talk about race, not because we have been explicitly instructed not to, but because we implicitly have determined that that's not what we do here in this school and, this, and in this district, we're going to come back with an outcome that sustains racial inequities in our schools and districts. I don't think you want that as leaders. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciated this opportunity to talk with you. I hope that you found these activities and approaches and strategies useful. Again, I've seen them work with such effectiveness over all the years that I've employed them. I wish you well as you attempt to lead productive conversations about race at school. Uh, Professor Ott, I will turn it back over to you at this time. Thank you, Sean, for showing us how to get into good trouble, necessary trouble, to redeem the soul of America.